Hey Saints, welcome back to Increasing Talents. Today I want to take you to the day before the inauguration. And I'm going to show you how deceived the world is. And sadly to say, many of us Christians. What I'm going to be showing you is that song that was sung the day before the inauguration where you had Biden, the president, the vice president, Camille Harris, and their spouses standing before the Washington Memorial. And it was a young lady singing the Hallelujah song, which many of you have heard. Okay, It's been sung in many churches. I remember last year on SNL, um, Saturday Night Live, um, it was sung by a person pretending to be Hillary Clinton and that same song was sung and you will see it sung in a lot of political arenas where they want a song that's supposed to be kind of religious or Christian song they'll sing the song hallelujah and like I said it's sung in many churches it's one of the most demonic songs ever written now I want to show you how easily the devil fools the world. Some of you watched that, um, I don't even know what to call it because it wasn't inauguration, but the pre-inauguration um, festivities. They had the Washington Memorial. They had all of these fireworks going off. And then you saw the first and second family standing there looking and it seems as if they're looking at the Washington Memorial. And I remember when I was watching it, I said to myself, do people realize that this is worship going on? This is worship going on. And then the song started to play. And I was like, oh my God. If people actually knew what was really taking place, if people actually took time to stop and listen to the words in the song, they would start understanding what's really happening in this country. I told y'all before, it's about being on God's side, not the world's side. Let me open up your understanding. So let's take a look at the song. It starts off, I've heard there was a secret chord that David played and it pleased the Lord but you don't really care for music do you then the person answers this is the first verse the first thing that sh should be noticed is that the writer says I heard it means he does not know the chord but who is he talking to he is asking a question, and the only clue we have on who he is talking to is he believes the person doesn't care for music. But think of this. Is the person asking the question being sarcastic? He is not saying the person doesn't care about music. He is asking, do you? I've heard there was a secret chord that David played, and it pleased the Lord but you don't really care for music, do you? The person receives the question and then he answers. And this is the person that is answering. It goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, the major lift, the baffled king composing hallelujah. It goes like this. This is not the person that asked the question. The question is now being answered. The person being asked knows the so-called secret chord. And remember now, they know the secret chord that was played by David, the king of Judah. And we're talking about 3,000 years ago. So now he is teaching the chord to Cohen. Those who understand music may be able to expound on the meaning of the answer. 
I want to note next that the person answering calls David baffled. Did you know the word baffle can mean to thwart, puzzle, or restraint? I truly believe the speaker means David was restrained, and the next verse will show this. Let's go to the next verse. Your faith was strong, but you needed proof. You saw her bathing on the roof. Her beauty in the moonlight overthrew you. Now, we know that this is talking about Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, that David saw while she was taking a bath. In the evening time, leading into the night, he saw her taking a bath, and it was actually her day of um, impurifications, and she was fulfilling her days of impurification, and, and she was the, um, ending it by taking a bath. And David saw her, and he lusted inquired who she was and then called her to the palace and then he slept with her. He committed adultery because she was a married woman. That was Uriah's wife. And Uriah was a soldier that was out in the war fighting for the king. And the king slept with his wife. And to make it even worse, David had ordered for Uriah to come back and spend a couple of days back in the kingdom because it had claimed up that Bathsheba was pregnant and David wanted Uriah to come home and sleep with his wife and nobody would know that she had committed adultery. But Uriah being a righteous man, he said, how can I sleep with my wife? How can I go to my house and eat and sleep with my wife while the rest of the soldiers and even the, 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 um, the leader of the army is out there fighting in battle. And he refused to go. So David sent him back to the war, but sent a message by his own hand. He carried the message that Joab was supposed to allow him to get into the heated parts of the battle where he would be killed. And that's what took place. So here we hear the person speaking on the matter your faith was strong but you needed proof and he's saying that and, and, and what's so amazing about this is that this is the same thing that the same type of technique that's used on all Christians you know when you go to that thing where the devil starts coming to you and starts saying prove that you're a Christian or prove that you can overcome the temptation Young Christians often go through this where the devil is to tell you to put yourself in a position of temptation to show that you can overcome it. And he knows you're not, you're not going to overcome it. You're going to fall to the temptation. And as young Christians, we go over it once, two, three, four, five times until we wise up and say, wait a minute, the Bible says avoid all appearance of evil, evil so why am I putting myself in the, in, the, in the way of temptation knowing that I always fall for it? And real wisdom is not to even put yourself in that position of temptation. You don't have to prove anything to anybody. Just walk in God's will. So when we see this, 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 um, this method of warfare going on right here, your faith was strong, but you needed proof. You saw her bathing on the roof. Her beauty in the moonlight overthrew you. She tied you to a kitchen chair she broke your throne and she cut your hair and from your lips she drew the hallelujah. When you hear that, many people think that the song has switched to Samson. And it is speaking about Samson now with Samson and Delilah. And when Samson um, was tied up by Delilah, but he broke the string. But it's not. It's still speaking about David. See, the tying means restraint. But the key thing is the cutting of the hair is not just a, 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 it's a symbolism. It's not just what happened with Sam, Samson, but it's a symbolism to us of when we're weakened, being weakened spiritually. A lot of times when God would give me a vision or a dream with someone who is cutting my hair, it will show me that I'm under spiritual attack and I'm being weakened. So I need to be weird. I need to go into prayer. I need to go into fasting. Okay? I remember the first time um, God showed me eating a, a bowl of ice cream and this person whom 
I was ministering to was standing behind me cutting my hair. And God was showing me that ice cream was the what I was being fed. It was the food I was eating, meaning what he was telling me. It was the fruit of his lips, the food that was speaking, the dainty meat that he was speaking. And he was speaking all this stuff about him being a Christian and about how he was under attack and he needed my help. And I was eating it up. I was eating it like ice cream. But it was food that was not really food. It's like artificial food. It's not good for me. And then it showed in the vision my hair being cut. And come to find out, like I told you about these people that are doing witchcraft that hide in the Christian churches, that want to go into Christian churches to deceive and prey on the naive. This person turned out to be a warlock. Straight up witchcraft. And everything came out. And yet when I first met them, he was telling me he needed my help because I was the one that was being prepped for attack. And he wanted to gain that friendship, me praying for him, praying for his family. And all the while, this guy was deep into witchcraft and it was a spiritual attack. He was a minion of the enemy. And that's why we got to use wisdom. But back to the song, it says, She tied you to a kitchen chair, she broke your throne and she cut your hair. And from your lips, she drew the hallelujah. She tied who to the kitchen chair? It wasn't Samson. What throne did Samson have? This is still about David. And it's a spiritual statement of how he was overcome. She is not Bathsheba, but a spirit. The kitchen is a place to get fed. And tied to the kitchen chair symbolizes force feeding. I want you to read this. This is from Proverbs 9. And 13 to 18. A foolish woman is clamorous. She is simple and knoweth nothing. For she sitteth at the door of her house on a seat in the high places of the city. To call passengers who go right on their ways. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. And as for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, Stolen waters are sweet. And bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he knoweth not that the dead are there. And that her guests are in the depths of hell. I know many believe the scripture is talking about an adulterous woman. But it's actually speaking about a spirit living in a body seducing people. David is being seduced by a spirit that bounds him through his sin. The kitchen chair means he is bound and then fed. Kitchen. And his hair being cut is just a spiritual sign of weakness. God has shown me on two or three occasions where I'm giving a vision with my hair being cut and it meant I was under attack and becoming weak. The Jews also see a vision or a dream of hair being cut as a sign of weakening. If you read the story of Samson, you will see that although similar terms are used, it doesn't match up. It's about David and how his throne was broken according to the speaker. The speaker is trying to show that the hallelujah that came from David was not one of praise, but one of being overcome. She drew the hallelujah out of him. It's spiritual warfare. And I want y'all to know something about the story. We've been going through these teachings on sleep paralysis and the things that happened there. Do you know that right before David went and saw her out there, he was sleeping? And he got up out of his bed? And then he walked out and he saw her? And then everything took place, leading to adultery and murder. But he was coming from his sleep. You see now why I, I, I speak to you all about dealing with the sleep paralysis, about the programming and the stuff that is implanted in our minds. And then we wake up and we're struggling with these desires or we're struggling with these, this anger or we're struggling with this, this, these things of the flesh. Because while we're sleeping, we're being programmed. So he woke up and that lust was on him. And then he went and saw her. Because 
you better believe that after the you've been programmed, the devil is going to move hell and high water. <laughs> He's going to move hell and high water to put you in a situation that whatever was programmed into your mind while you're sleeping could have the opportunity to be fulfilled. You better believe that. So here we have David waking up out of sleep and then he's gone and he see this woman according to the story in the Bible. But you see now that this ties into the sleep paralysis even with the David story. But so let's continue with the song, because I'm remember, I'm showing you that the song is not what people think it is. Because we're going to identify the person that's speaking. Let's continue. The next verse says, Baby, I have been here before. I know this room. I've walked this floor. I used to live alone before I knew you. I've seen your flag on the marble arch. Love is not a victory march. It's a cold and it's a broken. Hallelujah. Baby is not baby. The speaker is speaking of Babylon. First, when you hear the song, the baby seems out of place. Baby, I have been here before. I know this room. I walk the floor, this floor. Second, later in the verse, it talks about a flag on a marble arch. I've seen your flag on the marble arch. Love is not a victory march. In Babylon, when the kings would conquer a nation, they would build a marble arch across the roadway with pictures, sculptures, and writings describing the campaign and the conquering of the nation. This was also done in Rome. In Babylon, they had an arch built by Nebuchadnezzar with a picture of all the items that was taken out of the temple in Jerusalem. It's what I posted with the video. I believe this is what the speaker is talking about. And he says there's some type of flag on top. The speaker is saying he was in Babylon. He was in Babylon. Babylon, baby. I have been here before. I know this room. I've walked this floor. I used to live alone before I knew you. I've seen your flag on the marble arch. Love is not a victory march. It's a cold and it's a broken hallelujah. So he's saying that he was in Babylon. And again, this is, in this is identifying who this person is. And he's talking about the victory march. Remember, Babylon was the nation that came and destroyed Jerusalem. Okay? And he's talking about the victory march. Who is this person that's speaking? Who could it be? Let's continue. There was a time... When you let me know what's really going on below. But now you never show it to me, do you? And remember when I moved in you, the holy dove was moving too. And every breath we drew was hallelujah. Who is this speaking? The person that that, that, that that is speaking the coin is, is talking. He done left out a coin. Okay? He's not speaking the coin anymore. It's like the conversation and shift. He told Cohen the secret chord. He told him what happened to David. And now the conversation and switch. And it's like this person is talking to who? There was a time when I let you when you let me know what's really going on below. He's talking to God. The person is talking to God. This part trips me out because a lot of people who have tried to interpret the song say that this verse is talking about Mary and the Holy Spirit impregnating her. Remember, Cohen never told anyone what the song means. Cohen never told anyone what the song means. And I think people are trying to say the song is about sex like, 
uh, it was a guy named Buckley who, too, who um, stated that it was about sex and he did a cover on the song. Buckley also said that Cohen would not like that he had made the song about sex. The speaker is saying that at one time he was in a relationship with God. It's not Mary. He was in a the speaker was in a relationship with God and God told him what he was doing in the world. But now that relationship is broken. Look at Acts 17 and 28. For in him we live and move and have our being as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. The, now, now listen to what the person is saying again. There was a time when you let me know what's really going on below, but now you never show it to me, do you? This person was in relationship with God, but has lost that relationship. And he's saying, when, remember when I moved in you. So he was in God. The holy dove was moving too. And every breath we drew, we drew was hallelujah. So this is a person that was in a relationship with God, but that relationship is broken. And this is who Cohen is speaking to. And he's, and he's, and he's, he's like he's telling the story through the song, but he's giving the words of the person that's speaking. He says, remember when I moved in you again, I believe this is talking about being in a relationship with God and worshiping him in the spirit. To sum up what we know now about the speaker, he knows music. He knew what and how David fell. He was in Babylon. He was at one time in relationship with God. He no longer is. Many of you that are hearing this that is that are watching this many of you that are watching this are starting to get an understanding of who this person might be that Cohen is talking to and this is the person that is literally speaking in the song this is the person that's being glorified in the song and this is a song that they're speaking in churches this is a song that the president of the United States who says that he is religious and he's a Christian and he's standing in front of the Washington Memorial and this song is being played Let's continue. Maybe there's a God above, but all I ever learned from love was how to shoot at someone who outdrew you. It's not a cry you can hear at night. It's not somebody who has seen the light. It's a cold and it's a broken hallelujah. Let me point out first that the song, this, the song verse above is not a doubt of if God is or not, but acknowledging that there is a God. Maybe there's a God above. He's acknowledging, yeah, maybe there's a God above, but all I ever learned from love. So he's acknowledging that there is a God above, but all I ever learned from love. An example of this is in a sentence, maybe cars can go fast, but planes are faster. It's not a doubt that cars can move fast, but an acknowledgement. Okay? And then in the rest of it, it says the speaker is shooting at someone who has one up on him. People in line with God. Look at the scripture. Psalm 64, 1 through 7. Hear my voice, O God, in my prayer. Preserve my life from fear of the enemy. Hide me from the secret counsel of the wicked for the insurrection of the workers of iniquity, who wet their tongue like a sword and bend their bows to shoot their arrows, even bitter words, that they may shoot in secret at the perfect. Suddenly do they shoot at him and fear not. They encourage themselves in an evil matter. They commune of laying sneers privately. They say, who shall see them? They search out iniquities. They accomplish a diligent search. Both the inward thought of every one of them and the heart is deep. But God shall shoot at them with an arrow. Suddenly shall they be wounded. Now let's look back at the verse. Maybe there's a God above, but all I've ever learned from love was how to shoot at someone who outdrew you. 
This is a person that's shooting at the righteous who outdrew you. Someone that was better than you, faster than you, but you're shooting at them. It's the same thing as about Psalm 64, talking about those that hide in secrets, shooting at the righteous, trying to find a, a sin or some way to access, to get at the righteous people. And then it says, it's not a cry you can hear at night. It's not someone who has seen the light. It's a cold and it's a broken hallelujah. This is what's been glorified in there. You hear how the song is going? It's deep, but it's dark. It is not someone who has seen the light. It's not praise. It's not worship. But someone in distress. It's as if he's saying someone forced to say hallelujah. Let's look at the next verse. You say I took the name in vain. I don't even know the name. But if I did, well, really, what's it to you? There's a blaze of light in every word. It doesn't matter which you heard, the holy or the broken. Hallelujah. A lot of people don't understand what it means to take God's name in vain. It's not cursing or speaking his name without reverence. To take God's name in vain is to proclaim God as your Lord and Savior and then continue to walk in wickedness. That's what it means by taking the Lord's name in vain. It was, worth, it was a waste of time for you to take the name because you don't want to walk in holiness or righteousness. So now we know the speaker is a deceiver. I, I also believe the speaker stopped speaking here and Cohen, the song's writer, comes back in. So this is the part where the speaker is saying there is a blaze of light in every word. It doesn't matter what you heard, the holy or the broken hallelujah. But it does matter. There's a difference between the holy and the broken. So this person is lying. This is a liar. This is a deceiver. And you can tell by the first part of, of, the, of the verse. You say, I took the name in vain. I don't even know the name. But if I did, well, really, what's it to you? This is a liar. This is a deceiver. And then he's saying that there's no difference between the holy and the broken hallelujah. That's a lie. That's a lie. Let's look at a comparison of two hallelujahs. Revelation 19, 1 to 6. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornications and avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they say, Hallelujah! And her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen! Hallelujah! And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah! For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. That is the holy hallelujah. Now let's listen to the cold and broken hallelujah. Isaiah 45 and 23. I have sworn by myself the words is gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return that unto me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. Romans 14, 11 to 12. Romans 14, 11 and 12. For it is written, as I live, say the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. This is talking about every knee shall bow and every tongue is going to confess. Every tongue is going to give praise to God. Some are going to do it because they have made it in and they accepted by him. And others are going to be forced to do it because they are the wicked. 
and they're going to have knee is going to bow and tongue is going to confess even though they don't want to. Every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess. Some will be doing it willingly, the righteous, the holy, hallelujah, and some will be broken and cold and are going to still have to give that hallelujah. It does matter. Now, here is Cohen coming back in, and I want you to listen to this. I did my best. It wasn't much. I couldn't feel, so I tried to touch. I've told the truth. I didn't come to fool you. And even though it all went wrong, I stand before the Lord of song with nothing on my tongue but hallelujah. Cohen is saying here he could not feel God, so he dabbled in the spirit realm and came in contact with the fallen angel that was speaking. He realized that he has messed up, probably sold his soul. Then he identifies who it was, the Lord of Song. Nowhere in scripture is God called the Lord of Song. The only person who comes close to this title is Satan, who many believe has musical instruments in his body. I don't actually believe that, but that's another story. But many teach that, that Satan had musical instruments in his body. They teach that he was the one, he was a music director in heaven. That is who the Lord of Song is. That is who Cohen is speaking to. That is why Cohen asked him, do you know the secret chord? Because he was the Lord of Song. It's Satan, heaven's musician, as many believe. That's who this song is about. It's about Satan. It's not about God. And Satan's talking about how he broke David. And made David give out the hallelujah. And the hallelujahs are the same. It doesn't matter how it's spoken, which is not true. This is about David. And here, I'm going to repeat this. Here you have Cohen saying, I messed up because I approached this dude. I did my best. It wasn't much. I couldn't feel, couldn't feel God. Couldn't feel the spiritual realm. Couldn't feel everybody speaking about the power of the mighty God. And this is somebody that's Jewish. So he said, I couldn't feel, so I tried to touch, meaning he approached the spiritual realm. I've told the truth. I didn't come to fool you. And even though it all went wrong, meaning that he tried to, he tried to reach out to the spiritual realm, but he ended up reaching out to the wrong person. It all went wrong. I stand before the Lord of Song. He's standing before Satan with nothing on my tongue but hallelujah. He's praising Satan. He's praising Satan. He's praising the devil. He's standing before the Lord of Song. That's the devil. And he's giving praise to him. To sum up what we know now about the speaker, he understands music. He knew what and how David fell. He was in Babylon. He was at one time in relationship with God. He no longer is. He knows God's name. He is a liar and deceiver. And he is the Lord of song. Ezekiel 28 and 13. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Precious stones was thy covering. The sardis, topaz, and the diamond, the burly, and the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold, the workmanships of thy tabrets, and of thy pipes. Those are musical instruments, but is a, a deeper understanding in that for another video. Was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. That is literally talking about the Holy Spirit, guys. Continue. Thou was perfect in thy ways for the day 
that thou was created, thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created, till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. That's what Cohen was singing about. This song is glorifying the enemy, not God. And the first and second family stood before the Washington Memorial, giving worship to the Washington Memorial. They shot up fireworks. And they had lights lining up that are talking about the lives that died, the sacrifices, the lives that were sacrificed. And these, these, these lights lead straight to the Washington Memorial. And for some of you that don't know the story of the Washington Memorial, in every major city in the Western world, there is something called an obelisk. It is a tall pillar with a pointed end. Most of them were taken from temples in Egypt. They represent the sun god and the worship of other gods. They have one that was taken to Paris. There's, they have one in even in the United Kingdom. In all these major cities, these obelisks. And these are things that were generated in the ancient world in the worship of fallen these fallen angels that they were worshiped as gods the bible says these are devils and demons that they worship as gods so they put up these pillars to worship these things and some of y'all that might be religious and say well it has nothing to do with you even the, the the catholic church the vatican has one of these and the pope at the time that it was removed from egypt and brought to the vatican and placed in vatican city and he and it was a death um, charge on if it was broken that everybody would be put to death it had if, if it broken or cracked in any way and they brought it from egypt from pagan worship and put it in the vatican that people are saying is supposed to be something holy to God. So they brought these things and put them all over the world. And in the United States, we, we created our own. Our own obelisk. And we set it at the Capitol. And it is a, it is a pillar of worship. But it's not the God. God never told anybody to put one up for him. It's a pillar of worship. It's, a, it's one of the images of jealousy. And it was placed at the Capitol. And the day before the inauguration, this is what they were sitting there looking at, giving praise to. And it gets deeper than this. The next video, I'm going to deal with something that happened on January 3rd. About the, the, the bringing of these other gods into the... the, the, the um, politics and the gods that they really worship they go out and they tell everybody that they're christians but they're not christians and that's why i tell you as a saint as a believer and a follower of christ do not get caught up in this political stuff do not get caught up in it because these people that present themselves as christians they're not christians they're Hindus and they're pagans and they're part of the Egyptian um, um, mystery religion because those are the people that brought these pillars from Egypt. They are, they are members of the Egyptian mystery religion. These are the ones they call the shadow men. This is what they worship. And these pillars represent sun worship, which the Bible says none of us are to be participating in in any fashion or form. So they bought these pillars of the sun to the sun god. They brought them all over the western world. They put them on all these key cities. And in America, we erected our own. And they give worship to it. But they do it in a hidden way that people don't, don't know. And then they're singing a song that's giving glory to the Lord of song. That's saying hallelujah to the Lord of song. And so many Christians are believing this has something to do with God. This has nothing to do with God. We, 
as Christians are to be what? Wise as serpents, yet humble as doves. That's a talent for your money pouch. That's a talent. Do not go into situations with your eye cl eyes closed. Open up your eyes and look at what's going on. Pay attention to what being done. Don't just follow the crowd. Don't accept everything that everybody accepts. When those fireworks were going up and every TV station was playing and all you saw was a Washington Memorial, which is a pagan pillar of sun worship, that is what was being shown. Look at the pictures. Look at what's being shown. Look at what's being worshipped. You see how easily the devil has tricked the world? You see how easy we, as even Christians that don't understand wisdom and knowledge of the things of the Bible, can easily get tricked, and we'll be right out there with them, worshiping and praising, and don't even know we caught up in the same mess. We have to use wisdom, saints. We have to use wisdom. Don't be sleepwalking, talking about you woke. Be woke. Awaken out of your slumber and be wise and follow Christ and not man. Until next time, be blessed.